Hello, ladies. We are live on Facebook. We want to welcome our audience out there in Facebook land. Welcome to Galentine's Day. Stepping into who I am. So I hope if you're at home watching us, you have on your PJs and you have on your you see mine? Get the shoe. All right, so we're going to get started with our panel. I want to introduce um, the um, panelists at this time. We're going to start with Miss Tetra Shockley. Let's give her a hand. <laughs> Followed by Miss Sade Truitt. <laughs> and last but not least, my daughter, our host for tonight, Adaya Hall. <laughs> Well, hello guys. How are we doing tonight? Oh, y'all can give me more than that. Okay, well, I am so happy that we are here. I'm, um, as you guys know, my name is Adaya Holmes. I'm the host for tonight. Um, and I guess we can just hop on in. We're going to get started and we're going to start with our Q&A. So, if you guys are here in person, you guys would know that you answered some or gave us some questions to answer. We're going to be talking about three categories, Bible, body, and boys. And the reason why we're talking about these three topics is because we're going to be redirecting everything to the word body and boys, but especially because we're going to be talking about stepping into who we are in Christ. And as women, I think it's just so important when we are around other women who are not just confident, but confident in who they know they are in Christ. And then they can add that to their different relationships with their body or in other relationships. So, how are we doing, ladies? We good, honey. Happy Sunday. Yes, happy Sunday. So, I just want to start us with a little icebreaker question with our panelists. So, we were here last year, this time, or around this time. And I just want to know, last year we had our word of the year, whatever that word of the year was, and this year I just want us to start off with what word of the year we're starting with from 2023, and what advice you would give to yourself from 2022. Ooh. My word of the year is recompense. Uh, 2022 was, ooh, child, ooh, Lord, I don't want to think about it, Lord. <laughs> It was a really, uh, it was a tough year. It really was a make or break year. And so I spent some time in prayer complaining to God and mad at God about things that had happened. He said, Shadi, rest your short. I'm going to give you recompense in 2023. And I went and looked that word up, honey, ran around the house, began to decree and declare, found me a scripture to go with it. And I just believe that that is what God is doing. He's already started that for me. So it's recompense. And what I would say to myself last year was, baby, it's going to be all right. Just go through the process. Trust the process. Just trust the process. Everybody has a moment. Everybody has a year that wasn't the year that you thought it would be. You know, people saw me winning on social media, but they had no idea the nights I would go in my room and cry. And so I thank God for a praying mother. Ooh, Lord, I thank God for a mother that knew how to pray and how to encourage me. Girlfriends that would check on me and say, come on, sis, because I needed that in that season. But we up now. We outside now. We up now. <laughs> Yeah, so my my word for 2023, I actually wrote it on my journal to keep it before me, is be. Um, because, you know, first of all, just being a woman and then mother and wife and attorney. And I used to be involved in pageantries. And so many, all those different things can, if you let them, can tell you what you're supposed to look like, be like, how you're supposed to present yourself. And... Last year was, was a good year for me, but it was a transitional year for me. And so this year, God is just really working on my heart to just get me for him and let him tell me who I am and then be that. So that, that's my word. That's good. Well, y'all know me. I don't have a word. I got a phrase. I got a so my phrase for the year is don't take no for an answer. So one of the things that the Lord dealt with me on in 2022 is places that I didn't think I deserved to be or I didn't want to step into, 
he positioned me in those positions just to show me that I said that you can. So knowing that, you know, I came out of 2022 like wild God, I ended up somewhere that I had no idea I was going to end up being. And I'm talking about you read a job description and it says you need this degree, you need that degree, and I don't have it. And then I'm training the people that have those degrees. I know that was God. So it just showed me that I just, you know, when I think about Jeremiah 29 and 11, I know the thoughts and plans I have towards you, that his plans for us are good, not evil, plans of hope in the future, that I'm just taking all of it. That I, I know I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, and I'm not taking no for an answer. So now, I'm, I apply up all kinds of opportunities that he <laughs> 10 years, and he like, I don't have none of that, but I know this is going to be the opportunity. Come on. So I'm not taking it. <laughs> <laughs> this is the word. Okay, so my word for 2023 is contentment. Mm -hmm. And um, I feel like the Lord gave me a phrase too, like mother, like daughter. <laughs> like daughter, you know what I'm saying. <laughs> and um, I feel like the phrase that the Lord gave me was forever and always, Christ is enough. Okay. Um, and I feel like that is very pivotable, pivotal for me right now in my season of life because I'm 20 years old. I'm in college, and I am single, and I think that just learning that, you know, in every stage of your life, even when you're married and you have kids and all that stuff, you have to have Christ be the center of your life, but when there's no relationship in your life, it makes it more apparent for me that I need to make Christ the center of my life. Like, mm. if I don't have any other priorities right now, Christ is about to be the priority, and that's not to be the situation. And um, once I get him to be the priority, then everything else will start to come into alignment the way he needs it to be. But that wants that to be a permanent situation, but we're not. He's not in the army right now. Amen. Yes. Amen. Father God, lift him up. Pray him for him. Yes. So we have our questions. I don't want us to wait too long. So we have our three categories. Is there a certain category y'all want to start with? Body? Yeah, just go for it. Go for it? Okay, let's go for boys. Yes, this is the boys. Okay, this is a loaded question, or it's long. <laughs> How do you as a wife conduct your household when the head of your household is out of order, Ooh. not covering it like you should? Ooh. Oh, y'all are playing. That is I know. Cool. I know. I'm going to ask the wives on the panel. Let me sit back in this. Yes. <laughs> We're about to sit back. Now I'm going to let them do that. <laughs> The first thing I think that is that comes to mind that I know that is important as a wife is to always pray for your husband. So they have a responsibility to cover us in certain areas, um, being provider, priest, prophet, protector, pastor over your home. But we have a responsibility too. So always lift your husband up in prayer. Um, because here's the thing. If you are in order, you will to force that man to get in alignment and get in order what God says that he needs to be doing. Amen. You know, but let's say you did, you, you're you doing that, or you've done that. Um, don't stop doing it, but get with some other couples that where the husband is in alignment, where he can get mentorship. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think accountability and mentor, mentorship is really, really important. And you see an environment like this, Girls, we'll come together, we'll kiki, we'll laugh, we'll cry, we'll, we'll share our stretch marks, and you don't even know the person. Um, but we'll get really intimate quickly because we have that place. We're, I think we're accustomed to being vulnerable in that space, but men aren't. Mm -hmm. So sometimes you have to help them create that space and create those dynamics. Get in the men's Bible study or a men's group at church. But how about this? Talk, have a conversation with your pastor. Your spiritual leaders are really, really important. And if you think that he needs help and you all need help, get some some counseling on the matter. And if I could just say, too, um, be careful what you speak over him mm -hmm. and what you say to him. Because as a wife, our words are really, really powerful yes. to our husbands. We can really make or break our husbands. Mm -hmm. um, my pastor did a, a teaching on king maker or king breaker. Mm -hmm. Which one are you going to be? And so I think it's important to remember that the word of God says that death and life is in the power of the tongue. And so what you say about your husband, regardless of what you see him act in life, what you say about him matters. And if in your conversations with him, thank you, baby, for being the king of the castle. Thank you, baby, for providing. Say, say the good, big him up. 
Because I know for my husband, that makes him want to be what I need him to be. And I would just add, pour into him as if he is doing those things. Yes. So I am big. If you've ever had marriage counseling with me and Pastor Mike, we big on, I tell you, back that thing up. You want him in order? What do you think these high heels are for? <laughs> <laughs> you can't help us out. I know that's right. You know, I'm going to help you all the way out. When you're not in alignment, you're going to be in alignment when it's done. <laughs> Next question. <laughs> I love that. Well, that was really in a really good segue into this next question because sometimes, you know, for women and just people in general, when we're praying all the right prayers and we don't see the manifestation, sometimes it's hard not to question God. And this question is, is it wrong to question or ask God why? Absolutely not. I think that part of relation, I think we make sometimes relation with Jesus too religious. Yeah. Um, he wants us to talk to him just as, not as you talk to a friend, there's an honor there, but just lay it out to him because he cannot, he wants to take your brokenness and make it whole. Yes, he does know what's going on, but you know what it is to have a good conscience with your girlfriend and you just have a good venting session and you know what that does to you in the natural. Could you imagine when you have this conversation with God? And so if we do not have prayer lives and we're not in the presence of God on a daily basis with our daily devotion, when we're not talking to God on a regular basis, we will hold back. We will try to figure it out. But I think that it's okay. I, today, this morning, I said, God, come on now. Come on now. I done been begging. I have been fasting for 21 days. I done been at your feet. I done cut folks off. Now, you said some things only come through prayer and fasting. Now, come on now. We day 42. What's going on? So you have to have those real conversations. And when you let the Lord minister, because he ministered to me in this room, and on my knees about that conversation that I had about John, just make an exchange, y'all, man. You holding, this, you holding yourself up. You trying to hold on to the de- to the teddy bear, and I got the Bentley in the garage. Like, come on, let's just make an exchange. Get rid of that little raggy teddy bear, and what you holding on to? A little get after what I have for you. So I think that it's totally okay to ask God questions. You have to ask questions. You have to really go to uh, discover in. But I really challenge us all to make our daily devotion time a priority. Yeah. Don't date. You cannot go to God on a give me, give me, give me level. And he's like, where you been at, sis? We ain't been to worship all week. We haven't talked all week, so I think that that is the first step to be opening the door to asking God some questions. I think we have to remember He knows anyway. Yeah. So whether you ask Him why, He knows the why is in your heart. So you might as well just open yourself up and have that vulnerable relationship with Him. But I think we also have to remember that in His sovereignty, He doesn't have to give us an answer. And I know there have been times where in His graciousness, He's told me why. And then sometimes He, just like we do our kids, because I've said so. Just because I'm God, that's why. And so I think there's that balance between him being good enough to sometimes say, baby, this is why. And sometimes he's like, because, and, and I've, I've asked God a question about something and he said, that's not your business. Yeah. And so Ooh. sometimes you just have to let him be God. <laughs> and even a no has his goodness written all over it. You know what I mean? I've learned that in my time with going back and questioning God. Even that no is God's protection. is its redirection because, you know, in two or three months I'll look and be like, God, you all right with me. This is why I had to wait. This is why you said no. This is why that happened because he has something so much better for you. Because all things, come on now. Let's go to church for a second. All things work together for the good. Okay? Let's go to church for a second. I like that. Okay, so this one is a body question. It asks, what recommendations would you give for women in menopause trying to manage the mental and physical during this time? Okay. And I'm all ears because I ain't in that season yet. I can give advice and I'm looking for some. So that is my season. I'm hot right now. There is a book on natural um, on natural remedies and, and gosh, I forget who. Is it Colbert? He has a series. He has one on PMS, menopause, um, high cholesterol. I mean, but any illness, diabetes, you can you can name it. I recommend reading that book. He gives some very practical, both spiritual application as well as some natural things like natural herbs, black cohosh. Um, but if that doesn't work, most recently I had to go to my um, GYN and they put me on. They started with Lolo. That didn't work put me on progesterone that seems to be working this week. I slept a lot better because I would wake up in the middle of the night with the the hot sweats and um, um, hot flashes. Um, Keep a cold bottle of water with you. 
um, keep the temperature down, wear light clothes. I wear short sleeve in the summertime because that's just the season that I'm in. These are just some natural things. But then also, you know, take it before the Lord. Like pray, like God, you know, I need you to help me. You know, I think sometimes that we are um, neglect to invite God into every situation that we're dealing with. But here's the thing. He is our answer and he has an answer for us because he designed each and every one of us differently and uniquely. Mm -hmm. So you need to find the right rhythm for you. Mm -hmm. Have a conversation with your family so that you don't run them all off because, um, <laughs> you know, your temperament has changed. I went to the doc when I had a follow-up just a few weeks ago with my GYN. You know, they go through, if you've been in the season, they go through the survey and you have this, this, that. She got to movie. I said, no. Um, she said, you know, no, no mood change at all. I said, well, I just don't have no tolerance. Moody. <laughs> I was like, oh, okay, I am. I had to come home and own that. So, you know what I do now when I feel like I'm getting a little in? I go to my room and close the door to be by myself so that everybody else doesn't have to be subject to me being like, eh, okay? And now my husband knows, like, yeah, let me go to the basement because you're having a whole moment right now. And then 10 minutes later, I'm fine. I love it again. And then he comes back. So, you, but have that conversation so that everyone around you. They know what you're going through right now. But don't make it an excuse. Yes. Because sometimes yeah, we just say, oh, you know, we're nasty because... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Don't do not do that. Don't do that to the people you love because when you, you're you done through this season, you may, they may not be there if you chase them off. Yeah. So, you know, always just be mindful of just bringing that back under suggestion. That would be my advice to that. That's good. Yeah, that is really good. Is somebody doing menopause? Oh, yes, you, I She's do. surviving. Oh, yes. <laughs> Listen, she'll... She'll text me at 11, 11 p.m. at night and be like, can you turn down the heat? Like, make sure it's at a certain degree. And I'm like, okay. And don't tell your father I told you how to down. You might see. But anyway. Yes. Okay, so this one is a boy question. It says, how do you start the conversation to a chasticity? I think. I don't know if I'm saying that. Right. Thank you. If you have already been intimate. Okay. You want me to read again? I mean, I just think that you just, you know, you know, this is so antiquated, but if a man loves you, he's going to make the change. I just think you have to have a, first of all, you got to be confident in your own decision. Now, don't get somewhere, y'all go out one night and we didn't pay for steak 48, you got the pumps on, red bottoms on, that little short dress on, you told me, I'm going home, we go home. Now, come on now. Uh, but I think that when you're grown, you just have grown-up conversations. And I think that if you made a decision to save your body until marriage, if he loves you, he's going to say, okay, we're rocking with that. I just think this is a, once you have to be confident in that decision. You can't go into it shaky. You know, we got the lawyer beside us. She'll tell us, you got to go in there. This is it. You know? And um, that's it. That's, that's the decision. I think that when you're shaky and you're... You know, I've been praying, and you know, um, Sarah Jakes was preaching the other day about being bold, and you know, I'm just, no, hey honey, hey boo, you know, we got a good thing going on, I really love you, I really appreciate you, but I recommitted my life to God in a way that I want to honor him with my with my body, and so I just, I'm, I'm choosing to be celibate, and I hope that this relationship can be celibate, but if you don't want to be celibate, I wish you the best, you know, I send invitations to my king that's on his way, I think I say that, but you know what I mean. And that's good because... That goes to even before we started when we were in worship, um, being afraid to let some things go in order to get what God has for you. And so a lot of times as women, we compromise in relationships because we're afraid we're going to lose that man. But if he can be lost, let him be lost. And especially if he's going to be lost because you're standing on your godly principles and conviction. Because when my husband met me, I was already celibate. And I let him know at the very beginning, this is what I'm about and this is what I'm not about. And if you're not about that, we're not going to work. And so, but sometimes, and thankfully my husband wasn't this way, but sometimes they want to challenge you to see if you really mean it. Mm. Mean it when you say you mean it, because what my husband, and here we are almost 18 years later, one of the things he'll tell you today that he loves about me is that, that he had met people who said they were serious about Christ who weren't. And in our marriage, he trusts me because he said, if I had to wait for the cookie, I know you're not giving it to anybody else. So my husband right. trusts me more because I made him. I don't want to say I made him wait, but because I made him wait. <laughs> yeah, I would just add, do inventory on where he is in his spiritual walk. Because, you know, think about this question. This was me and my husband. We had 
already had sex, and when we got engaged, we decided no sex. So it was for 13 hot, horny months. Let's <laughs> be real, no sex. And um, but when we had the conversation, we were both at the same place spiritually that we knew we can't go into our marriage like this. We because we knew the assignment on our life. We God was revealing to us then where we were going to be today. And we didn't want to go into our marriage like that. Yeah. So we had to make a decision then that we loved God and his assignment for our life more than we love where we were in our relationship. We wanted to do better. Yeah. So, you know, so I would examine like where he is. If you feel and, and, and how about this? Even where you are, because if you're strong um, and you have a certain conviction about certain things, then you will train him on what you're going to get, what you're not going to get. Yeah. And at the end of the day, they respect that. I'm sorry. At the end of the day, they really respect that. Yeah. You know, as a single woman who is not doing any of that because that's just the commitment I made in my life until marriage, um, they respect that. There's an honor that comes on you when you, when you, be, when you, be, when you come, when you become that. Yeah. There's something even more attractive about you when you're not allowing that to be the crooks of the relationship. And then it allows you to really see what you're working with. Can he really, is he temperate? Is he patient? Is he not going to put your situations to challenge you, to put you in a situation? Can you go and do other things and find other ways to be non-sexual and still have a good time and get to know the relationship? Because the worth and call in your life, you can't risk it for a one-night stand. You can't, you can't, or two nights. You can't, you can't waste your oil. Because you prayed and suffered for that oil. Let's be real, you can't waste it. You know what I mean? That you have, you have suffered, you have set yourself apart, you are saying no to other things in your life, and it's just not worth it. There's going to be, you have a lifetime to enjoy that, and God knows the desires of your heart. Please, I won't let you play around with that. I have, I have, I have woken up, I just told you this laughing about dating. I was dating a guy, I just told Miss Jane, and she said, oh God, I pray for you. Great going, we was going strong, going good. I have said one prayer to God about this gentleman. I have not, I told Miss Jane, I said, I haven't heard from man since. <laughs> I said one prayer. I said, God, I have one question about this man. I went to God about it. No love lost, wish him the best, but that's how much God loves us. We're not going to play around with it. Yeah. Mm. And I, and I want to say that I, I like that you um, talked, to, talked about where is he in his walk yeah. too, because anybody in this room who is married for any length of time knows there's so much more to marriage than sex okay because life you, there's so much more and so depending on where he is in his walk forget the sex can you pray me through this come on can that's you, sexy can you believe with me about this come on can we go to god in prayer when we don't agree about that can you believe when we, when we came in agreement and things ain't looking right. quite right, are we still standing on the word of God for that? Mm. When, when you're slipping and you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing, is there a man of God that you'll allow to hold you accountable? That's and true. so if you just make it about sex, you done missed it. That's because true. as a woman of God, if your husband isn't at that place, that is detrimental yes. to a marriage. That's good. Okay, what's Mm -mm -mm. We got a lot of questions. I know. All right, so this is another Bible. It says, how do you navigate the Bible or the use of the Bible for mental health guidance? Mm -hmm. And I know that this is like, I don't want to tread this topic lightly because sometimes a big stigma in the church is, oh, just pray about it and you'll be fine. So how do we tell another queen, oh, there are practical and spiritual ways to go about doing this? Oh, that's a good one. I don't see my therapist every week. I was going to say, they have to stop being afraid of going to yeah. therapy and counseling. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know what it is about the church that, that you know doesn't want to tell people they can go get counseling. You know, the, the word of God says that we overcome by the blood of the lamb and, right? The blood of the lamb and by the word of your testimony. So some things, the blood of the lamb ain't enough. That's right. Right? So we know what the scripture says. We know what the Bible says. But you can get some natural, practical help. Yeah. And apply the word of God to that. So I think, you know, yes, we could say, oh, well, just look up some scriptures on, you know, what the Bible says. About. No, go get, so reach out to someone who is qualified to help you through what you are going through. People in the church are depressed and they're hiding that they're depressed because you go to the bishop and the man and woman of God and they make, you feel, like you, on you, made, right, make you feel like you're not in the word enough. What Did you hear what pastor preached about on Sunday? And did you, you listen. Yeah. Time out for that. I agree. I, I would also add that I think um, the combination of the anointing and education is a dangerous combination. So mm -hmm. when you have a counselor that knows the word, that yes. can build you up in your relationship of who you are as a woman and who you are as a Christ, 
and they're clinically sound, that's a, that's yes. a dangerous dynamic combination. I would not recommend counseling that, um, and, and, I, and I agree, clinical counseling I think is important, but I would find, make sure that that person is believing what you are believing yes. as well, yes. because mm -hmm. I think that's really, really important, yeah. mm -hmm. because they're going to have an insight that God's going to give them concerning yeah. you, yes. so that when they speak to you, they, you know, like the Holy Spirit is telling them, like, this is what this person needs versus the next client that right. comes in. Yeah. Um, I think the word of God pertaining to, you know, the question on um, navigating the, the Bible, there, there's so many scriptures that can bring about healing, especially pertaining to healing of the mind, yes. or even, I, I, yes. I like to say, our perception of things. Like, there's a way that God sees things, and then there's a way that we see things. I know that in my season, for those of you that won door prizes and you got my book, Bad Lady, I wrote that from a season of being in a very dark season. That, And, and when I say that, um, no one, not many people that knew me knew that. Because I did not allow everyone to be in my inner circle during that season. Some of you were part of that journey because you, you were part of my group. But um, out of that came that book. And um, I remember sitting down writing it with a whole, I started writing the beginning, like, with a, I had a whole attitude with God about different things that were going on. And again, I had all the smiles. My husband and I, we were doing ministry. Um, all our needs were met, like the kids were great, but I just was in, I did not have joy. I did not have joy in the place that I was in, and then there were some other circumstances where some, some issues from my past came flooding into my life, and this was like in my late 30s. But what I can say from going to the Word of God is that it brought so much healing in my life along with the people that God placed in my life to help bring about healing that were counselors, that were pastors, that were spiritual moms and dads and people like that. But all God used all of that in addition to the Word. But I would say through prayer and reading God's Word and really just helping God using the word to help me understand the situation, like why I was feeling the way I was feeling, even being able to trace the root of it, that when I came out of it, it was like, I'm coming for you, Satan. I'm not the one. Don't let the 410 fool you. I got on here. So 5-3. But I came out so much stronger in that season that I would say that it was worth it because when I look at the faces of the women in this room that have um, read the book, that have come through the couch. This is why I started that group, because I got tired of women not having a place, especially, especially women in leadership, don't have a safe place where they can come and just be a woman. Like, I needed to come and not be your pastor, your minister, Miss J. Like, I ain't praying for you today, because I don't have the capacity to do it. I need somebody to pray for me. I need to lay out, fall out, cry. You pray for me, lay hands on me, and give me some food so I can go home and deal with my own family. Like, I just didn't have the capacity, but I, I wanted... What came out of that was just creating an environment where women could come, where they can get what they needed. So... I just encourage you, like, open your heart. Like, open the word, open your heart, and just let God lead you to the right people. Everybody can't be trusted with where you are. They cannot be trusted with your brokenness. They will run your business. They cannot be trusted. But if you take the time in the word, God will show you who you can trust. And that's what he did for me. Amen. 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 Okay, so we're moving on to a body question. This lady asks, how do I become more comfortable with me in this new chapter of my life as I hit 50? Congratulations on hitting 50. <laughs> my anxiety is increasing over the things I do not have control over. Confidence is a decision. It's a decision. It's a decision to believe in who you are despite what the circumstance looks like. And so every day you're not going to feel the most confident, but every day you're the baddest chick in the game. And so I really think that you have to have a, it's a knowing, it's a belief. You don't put confidence in the lipstick, it's not my Louis bag, it's not my Gucci bag. It's a decision to walk into the authority that God's created me to be, and then I adorn myself to fit that. 
And so when you make the decision to be confident, you have to practice confidence. It's a muscle. You have to do things that make you feel confident. You know, you have to wear that same dress that makes you feel good to, to make you feel confident. You got to get around people that praise you. Stop being in a place where you're tolerated and not celebrated. That wears on your confidence. You know, be around women like this that are going to praise you and uphold you because you're, you want to begin to use the muscle of confidence. But just like love is a decision, confidence is a decision. A part of that and we're not feeling confident, there's a root to that, that therapy sometimes, that going to God sometimes will help us really discover. And therapy is great. I believe in it. My, she the best. She the best one in the game. And I'm not giving no referrals out. I don't want nobody blocking my time. So I love y'all. We'll find someone good. But anytime I go to therapy, I then take what Dr. Thomas gives me and I go to God with it. You know, I say, God, you know, her, her strategy, her tactic is great. Getting me to think about something differently is great, but God, I don't know how that how that fits in the word of God as it relates to Shade. Show me where that is. Because sometimes it will wear your confidence. But confidence, you don't gotta grow it. I was a church girl. All I knew was church. I was raised in the church. This red lipstick was a sin. Wearing these pajamas in front of y'all was a sin. You know, it, that's just not what we did. I was I was sheltered. My brother played in the NBA, so it was Jesus in the NBA. And so there was no identity there for a number of years. And so I had to build confidence. There's a story behind that, but it was a it's a muscle. It's an everyday decision to say that I'm it, that I'm the head and not the tail. What does God say about you? And then what do you say about yourself? Don't say them affirmations that Oprah's telling you to say, and then you don't believe it. Okay? Go find you three that you believe and begin to use the muscle of confidence. When you work out, you don't feel, you, when I go to the gym at 6 in the morning, I just tell you, I don't, don't talk to me, don't look at me. But baby, when I leave that thing, girl, you can't tell me nothing, honey. Head all over my head, sweating. It's a muscle. It's a decision. Just decide, I'm confident. And then find things to filter that to boost you up. And get around some good people. Get rid of them crazy women and crazy friends. There's some good people around you. Okay. Amen. All right. How does a single woman wait patiently for the Lord to move in her love life? Okay. Travel. Ooh, I like that. You know, do things for you. You know, take the time. Celebrate yourself. Take yourself shopping. Take yourself to Victoria's Secret. Wear cute underwear for yourself, not for me. Okay, not for me, but for you. Buy yourself some cute little paintings and glosses just for yourself. Get out. Go to singles ministry stuff. Go out to dinner with your girlfriends. And then while you're just casually doing what you're doing, then you'll get found. But don't go on the prowl. Well, yeah. Okay, ladies, we're going out to dinner because we're going to sit at the bar because, you know, on Friday night at happy hour. Oh, well, the rich didn't come. come. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to do that. Celebrate you and enjoy the season that you're in and then watch God allow the spotlight to be on you. And give back to somebody. Volunteer. Find something All to do. Dappy. Boys and Girls Club, your church, get involved in something. Find purpose in something, and that will help you really cultivate that time. But one more thing. But look cute. Always. <laughs> okay? The Bible says, see, the find a good wife, find a good book, well, you got to find a good thing. But we're neon colors. Be bright. <laughs> you can get that. Go ahead and go back. And get what the get, get in the gym. Get your credit up. Get that degree. Oh, get that Do all that. Get that time. Yes, I love it. So this is a body, I mean, Bible question. It says, I'm soon to be an empty nester. How do I find my purpose outside of my children? Aww. So, um, I... I have a couple years. I have two years before Tierra's gone, but then I'll still have Jaden. But what stuck out to me in that question was purpose. And so I think, again, as women, we get caught up in titles, and we call that purpose. And motherhood cannot be your purpose. Because that would mean, if God forbid something happened to your children, now you don't have purpose. So that, Or if you don't become a mother, that you don't have purpose. So our purpose is not... I'm a lawyer. My per God, God didn't send me here to be a lawyer. Those are platforms in order to fulfill purpose. So I think it's important to find out, God, what did you send me here to do? Tap into that and then find other ways to pour into people to, to use, again, as a platform for your purpose. And don't make the titles wife, mother, lawyer, teacher, educator, philanthropist, your purpose, because that's not what God sent you here for. That's good. That's good. That's good. 
Do you think it's important to take care of your physical appearance even after 20 years of marriage? Mm. Oh, yes. Yes. Okay. <laughs> yes. Absolutely. So, yes, absolutely. Here's the thing. He married you fine. Don't turn into a pumpkin. Yeah. Now, here's the thing. We have children. Our bodies change and things like that. I understand that because mine has changed. I was a size 2 and now I am not. But here's the thing. <laughs> wives can't be just because our husband wants this or he likes it. You will feel much better about yourself. It kind of goes back to this, the question we just had about your purpose. If you take care of you, then everyone around you is going to feel good about you and you're going to feel good about yourself. So take care of your physical being. Go to the gym. Exercise. Walk. You're doing it for cardiovascular health. Not because you want your husband to just feel and think that you're still sexy. And that is important. But first, take care of you for you. But yes, I think it's very important to present yourself in a manner where it says to your husband, I care about me. When we dress, you know, our clothing is a, an expression of our personality and how we care for us. It says, I care. And if you don't do certain things, it can look like you don't. Absolutely. So we Absolutely. So care for yourself. Eat right. We want to live a long time so we can let see our children's 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 children and influence their lives. So, you know, not just be sexy for our husbands. But I do think it's important to be sexy for your husband. Yes. Okay? Hello. Men are visual. You know? So, you know, he wants to see a little eye candy. Push them girls up sometimes. <laughs> keep that fire and we're going to still, you know, you pray, Lord, let them just only have eyes for me. We'll give them something to look at. Okay. <laughs> I like it. Who goes to work and Saudi got her hair done? Well, Jamie's going to have hers done, too. Okay. Well, that's good. Yeah. 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 Don't be in the same clothes that you were in when you left. <laughs> you know, don't have the scarf and the bonnet on. You know, and my husband came home for lunch. So that didn't give me the, lar the largest window of time. He came home for lunch every single day. So, but by the time he got home, I wanted to make sure I was showered, you know, brush my teeth, comb my hair, unwrap my hair, you know, put on a little bit of lip gloss, and, ha you know, had the baby dress so that he didn't see me like, Girl, like, you have one of the same pajamas. <laughs> you know, like, here's a, I think it's important to make the effort and not get comfortable. Okay? You want to still wow him. You want to walk across the room and he'd be like, ooh, ooh. I want something. Let me go see you. How do I forgive my spouse after repeated adultery? Should I stay or should I leave? So first, the word, you know, so forgiveness. We're required, irrespective of the circumstances, by God to forgive the person. Not and here's the thing, it's not for their benefit, but it's for yours. Yeah. Because then that person has an opportunity to have mental real estate in your mind. You're constantly rehearsing and going over the situation because you won't release it and you won't release them. You know, the best thing you can do in a situation like this, release them to God. For God, that's your duty. You can yeah. hate him. And I'm going to let you deal with that. You know, I think accountability, and, and these are a couple of, I'll give you a few tips that we've given couples that um, have come to us. They've been in these situations. Is First, we always ask them, do you want the marriage or not? Because I believe that God honors reconciliation. 
The, does a person under these circumstances have an out? Biblically, yes, they do. You know, and they could walk if they so choose. But does God honor um, the reconciliation of the marriage? Absolutely. Because here's the thing. In marriage, um, it is the only thing, that it is the closest thing that God holds up as a trophy in the earth for us down here to see Christ's relationship with the church, his love, his eternal love for the church. Think about it. We being the church, we've done a whole lot of things to God. We've committed adultery and idolatry on many a time. But guess what? God's commitment to us is never failing. And that's what God wants us to have in our marriages. You know, but if you want to stay or leave, we never tell anyone under these circumstances to leave. Because if I say leave him, you are going to blame Miss Jamie for telling you and advising you to leave him. That is your choice. You're going to have to search your heart. We've seen people decide in those circumstances that we have to go our separate ways, and that was what was best for them. Pray about it before you do anything. You know, weigh the options. You know, look, don't look at a situation in a vacuum, but look at it in totality. How about this? Is the person repentant? You know, it says repeated. That could be up for question. You know, I, I heard a testimony of a woman that said her husband had had 17 affairs. And I sat there like, oh, God, like, and he's still alive? <laughs> you know, but she said, and when she, he got to 17, she was done. She said, I believe, she said, the Lord told her, stay. She said she was so glad she did because it was after that 17th time he turned around. She said she had the best husband she's ever had. Mm. I don't know too many testimonies like that. I applaud her. I'm not mm. saying that that has to be your circumstances. I don't know what your circumstances are. Um, but she decided it was worth it for her family and for the marriage. And he is the best thing that God, I mean, like God completely, a complete 180. But you have to know what God said concerning you. And there's nothing wrong with you. You are worthy. Yep. You are the bomb. You're not doing anything wrong. wrong. You are the full package. There's nothing wrong with how you're handling. Just woman to woman, I'm not married yet, but just woman to woman, don't blame yourself. Don't go into that cycle that if I change my hair, if I lose 10 pounds, that, that, if you're doing that, do that for you. But you are worthy right where you are. You are doing an amazing job. You are holding down the house. You are put, holding it together. You still getting dressed up and going to work despite what's happening at home. You still smiling. You in your right mind. You are you amongst us. You you're worthy. You are enough. So rest in that. But make sure there's accountability there. If there's not accountability, yes. then I think that's a red flag. All right. Moving on to the next question. How do you raise godly children who aren't more influenced by social media than by your words? <laughs> Brenda didn't have no problems. Brenda had to bond. We have social media. We, I had to follow Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No options. Oh, you can not have to answer that. Hmm. <laughs> um, sure. I mean, I can say from the child's perspective that when you're being understanding of your child in this day and age, being a child in this day and age is hard. I mean, there are a lot of worldly influences. I think if you're going to be teaching your child about the Word of God, you have to teach it to them in a way that they understand. That, that relates to that child, because how one child gets it is different than how another child gets it. And let's say you have multiple kids. You may have to teach it to them differently yeah, and in yeah. different ways that they can all relate to it. Yeah. And I think if you are not able to do that, then it's going to be hard to put the word into it because then they're just going to be like, oh, you're just throwing the word at me and you're just trying to get me to go to church. And now they see the word as a punishing stick and not as a mm. resource to be able to be a guide to their life, and now they see it as, oh, it's something I want to avoid because it's something you bring up every time I do something wrong. Mm -hmm. So I don't don't think that um, you have to have a relationship with your children where you can communicate. Mm -hmm. I think our kids today don't feel like they can talk to their parents, like like we're not a safe place for them. So I think the first thing is having a a relationship of open communication, Mm -hmm. Right. And then I also think that we have to model what we're teaching our children. Mm. 
Yes. So I think when our children see how we handle certain situations, how we dress we when we house? leave the house, come on, <laughs> how we're talking to our husbands, how we're, you know, just wherever we are, that we're consistent. Because I also think that sometimes we got a church face and then we have an at home face. And I think we lose credibility with our children when we're not the same all the time. I think we also have to be willing to acknowledge when we're wrong with our kids. I feel like parents don't know how to say, baby, mommy missed it. And I think that those are the kind of things that help you to build a relationship so that you can have those tough conversations with your children and so they can trust what you say about the word, how the word works, and how to apply it because they also see you walk in and out. And autonomy. Like, let your child make a decision that may not be what you would have wanted for them so that you can have that lesson to bring back and say, this is, this is why we make decisions based on the word of God because you made a decision and look at, and, you know, the consequence was that. But also the Molly, you know, I, my mom and dad, they were, we were in church and I saw their prayer life at Sunday morning, but also at home on Saturdays, it was cleanup time and she and then I all around the house. So I think that modeling is powerful, but the autonomy of letting a child make a decision so they're not a shelter church girl, go to DSU, lose their mind and go but crazy because it's freedom. So allowing them to make decisions even early in the game, you can kind of steer them on how to disciple their decisions. Yeah, I think that's important. We all, I would always ask Alana and I have like, well, you know, if they ask what I thought, well, what do you think? Yeah. Because I wanted to just kind of just hear their process of coming to that decision for why they should do, should do X, Y, and Z so that I could help to stir them yeah. in the right direction. I think open lines of communication. When you, you know, when, when you get married, you come from two different histories and two different parenting styles. But... Um, I would say, you know, what I learned as, a, as um, a child with my mom, and I grew up, I grew up church girl. Like my, I don't know nothing else. I just grew up church girl. But um, my mom always made going to church fun. Like we would be at the all night this, the gospel go go. I grew up in D.C., so gospel go go. I mean, we were at all so many cars, so the Clark sisters. Um, I mean, just everything. And I always just enjoyed. I felt like I was at a party. Like hey, we had out. Friday night. I didn't know. It. I didn't even realize it was. It wasn't a party party, but it was always enjoyable for me. She never made church like, like oh, we gotta go to church. So just be careful how you like present God to your kids. And the earlier you start, the better. But it's but everybody has a day one. It's never too late. So let's say if you you know didn't raise your kids in the Lord you know since birth, and now you're finding you know God in a relationship with Christ. Start where you are. Yeah. and meet them where they are. Yes, yes. And I just want to add one little thing. I think it's also important that, you know, our parents, they try their best with what they're given. So they pour into their children based off of what they knew at the time. And even if it wasn't the best thing, like they're, they're trying their best, there isn't a quote-unquote rule book on how to be a parent. You do what you can do with what you can do with what child you have, and I think that that's very important to understand. All right, so the next question. Oh, yes, yes, yes. I got one. I got one. <laughs> How can I keep a positive body image when social media is constantly emphasizing perfection? Oh. And I struggle with this. So. Wait, take a social media break. Because I believe it's designed to just infiltrate, you know, our, our spirit to make us, you know, that spirit of comparison um, steps in when you see everybody's happy, their kids are perfect, their marriage is great, and they drop the Bentley. See, they have to post that they live in the projects. So, you know, sometimes you need to take a break so that you can refocus and have the right perspective. Mm -hmm. But the other thing is just take a look, look in the mirror and celebrate who you are. When I was a kid, my mom had, oh, you know, had challenges with her weight. And she would always, I'm the youngest of three girls, she would stand us in the mirror and want, because she wanted us to admire what we saw because she struggled with that. So that was one of the things that she wanted to instill with us, with us. Well, guess what? I'm reminded of that even as my body has changed over the years, that when I walk past the mirror to just celebrate where I am because, and, and not, you know, and not celebrate it from a place of, you know, I used to be a size this and now I'm that, but I mean celebrating right where I am and just seeing the beauty in who I am, not just on the outside, but even the things that are on the inside. Am I perfect? Far from. 
But here's the thing. But just being happy, just being me. And I think sometimes we, you know, allow as women, we look at the next woman and we compare ourselves. We don't know what her circumstances are. You don't know what her story is, and you don't know what it has taken for her to be able to have that smile on her face. Maybe the testimony she has, you wouldn't even want to have. Amen. You know, so just, you know, so just, you know, be happy. You know, find joy and contentment in, in the place where you are. All right, so this question says, how do I identify my purpose? Mm. I love that question. So Pastor Ted is my pastor. He, he gave us, he said three things. What are you good at? What do you love? And what do you hate? And he said, what you're good at is a good indication of what you're called to do, right? What you love that's a good indication, but even what you hate, what bothers you, could be a, a clue to what you're called to. So what bothers me, what I hate, is Satan messing with women's identity. I hate to see women suffer with who they are and struggle with who they are. And that spirit of comparison can't with it. What I love is to be around women and to celebrate women and to encourage women. And what I'm good at is encouraging women and speaking and all the fun things. So I know that I have a ministry call on my life and I have a gift and a call to women. And so that was kind of those three things help you kind of clue in. Obviously it's prayer, it's getting before God, but just practically, I think those three things help. Amen. Amen. All right, so a boy question. How do you stay an independent woman when God tells us we should find a godly man? He that findeth a wife findeth a good thing. And when he because you are a good thing, you're gonna add so much value to his life. So you don't have to become less independent and less of a boss lady in the field. You just adjust yourself accordingly so that the marriage is balanced. You know, one of the biggest things that I struggle with is I got emotional the other day, is I made a lot of sacrifices to get to where I am in my career and it's cost me marriage and kids, just to be very honest. You know, I have an amazing career beautiful beautiful mom dad and brother but i go home to a beautiful apartment by myself many nights and so crying before the lord the other night was like god like it gotta be more life than this like what's up like i'm, I'm, I'm i mean come on god i mean come on like what's up i'm a good girl i got myself together but i made a sacrifice i made a sacrifice to go after my goals to go after my ambition so that when i do meet my husband it won't be so much of the hustle behind it. And so you don't have to be less of who you are when you are looking when you are in the field for a mate, but baby girl, relax. He that find it a wife. You can be in Africa. You can be in Australia. You can be out in this parking lot. He that find it a wife. You're the good thing. You don't have to go chasing and positioning yourself. Be cute, be confident, make your money, drive your car, do all those things, but rest in the fact that God got you and that He's gonna find you wherever you are, He's gonna find you. Well, first of all, I don't think that God tells us we should find a godly man. I think there's a place for just being single forever, really. I mean, according to your desire. So I don't think that, that you have to, first of all, be married. If that's your desire, then that's a different conversation. But the Bible doesn't instruct us to be married. Um, but in terms of independent woman, I think that's a worldly thing. And I think that that's the problem Thank with you. women is that we want to be an independent woman. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I think that when we learn for submission, yes. that's, that's our problems. We don't want to submit. Mm -hmm. And so our independence affects our relationship with God. Yes. That's mm -hmm. why we don't trust God to provide. That's why we don't trust God to heal for whatever it is we need him for, because I got this. I'm an independent woman. And then you take that mentality into a marriage when mm -hmm. you're supposed to submit to your husband. Mm -hmm. And so I think we have to stop buying into the secular world and what they say that a woman is supposed to be and what Thank they you. say a marriage is supposed to be and get in the word and again become the woman that God calls you to be and then he'll bring you the man you're supposed Amen. to have if you're supposed to have him. Absolutely. So let's, by definition, submission sir, means under mission and vision. So you want to, when you marry someone, you're placing yourself under the vision that God is giving that man for your family. You are a co-labor and partner with him to carry out that mission and vision. Here's the thing, if he doesn't have a mission and a vision, pause. Right. If he doesn't if he doesn't have a clear direction on where God is taking him in his life, he doesn't know his purpose, just put pause on that. 
because then it makes it difficult for you to place yourself under the mission and vision because there isn't one. Right. You know, so what do we do so as women? We multi we cause things to multiply. Yes. You give us a seed, we're gonna multiply, we're gonna give you a baby. You give us a mission and a vision, we're gonna multiply yes. that. Yes. If the mission and vision is void or it's chaotic, you know what the woman is gonna do? Multiply Man. that. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Okay? So Submission is not a bad word. It's a position of power. You have more influence over that man by submitting to him than you do if you don't. So don't think that you are being made lower. As a matter of fact, you are in the position of influencing power in that home. So don't, you know, for those of you that are wise, don't be intimidated. Don't get frustrated by the word submission. I used to not hate that word. I, I tripped over that word during our vows. If I played my wedding video back in system, I was like, no. I was like, I couldn't even get it out of my mouth. But, and I was like, Lord, you knew. I was going to have a hard time with this one. You know, but once I learned the true definition of it. And here's the thing. When you have a man that's a godly man, you won't have no problem with that. Because he is in alignment with God. He will take good care of you. Because he knows you are God's daughter. He won't mess that up. All right. What are some good biblical examples to reference when you're going through a storm? Oh, my girl is Hagar. My girl is Sarah and Hagar. Um, mm, that's a good one. You gotta read the scripture, but Hagar had wait in the desert, crying and upset about Sarah, and God says, I see you. Mm. So no matter where life takes you, God is always gonna find you. And I've been meditating that for the last three months that that was a girl. We were working together. That was a girl. She was that was her servant, her master, whatever. And the second that you said your husband said that you he could sleep with me, I didn't even agree to this. This is what y'all didn't figure out. Now I'm the one that's put out. But Hagar, we know, was carrying something so powerful. So in that moment, God saw her, and that is so powerful because as, as this woman, sometimes we just want to be seen. Yeah. Like, I don't want to bring my gift all the time in every room that I go into. I don't want to always have to be on in every room that I go in. God, whoever, I just want you to see me. And in that moment, she saw God and God saw her and she was relieved of that. And then God told her to go back and submit to Sarah. That's another, that's another conversation. But in that moment, she had that freedom. And so wherever you are in life, just remember God sees you. He sees you. I, my, oh gosh, I got a, a, a bazillion. Mine is, um, what comes top of mind is the story of the Shunammite woman in Second oh, Kings, yes. how her and her husband had everything but a child. Um, the man of God prophesied that they were going to have a child. They did, and when the child was about 12 or 13 years old, she was in the field, he, the child was in the field with his father. The child died. She did not trip. Now here's the thing, and, and, and what encourages me most about this scripture is because as mothers, we know how dear to our heart our children are. And I know, you know, with my kids, I have prayed and prayed and labored and prayed and just, you know, throughout their life, like, you know, God, do the, you know, are they hearing what I'm saying? Or, you know, just different things when I just felt like they were ignoring what I'm saying or just, just anything with my kids. But, um, but anyway, in the story, um, she does not trip. She goes back to the man of God that told her that God said that this was her promise. And she says one thing, it is well. Mm -hmm. That was all she said. She didn't trip. She didn't fall out. She didn't say call the ambulance. She didn't do none of that. She didn't call 911, call the pastor. She said, it is well. Mm -hmm. And any circumstance, I'm just reminded that no matter what the circumstance, God's got me covered. He's going to make it well no matter what the situation is. Yeah. So that's my, that's my one. Yeah. Amen. All right, we're going to spice it up a little bit. Ooh. Talk about the SEX word. Okay. <laughs> yes. Yes. Talk about she sex. spells it. I say sex. <laughs> How do I? Yes, Jesus. How do I keep a healthy sex life with a full-time job and children? Ooh. Okay. That's a good one for you. Yeah. There's so many about this one. Come on. Yeah. Let the people know, honey. <laughs> Prioritize. It has to be important. And I know for like you, you were saying you kick the kids out. Sometimes the kids ain't got nowhere to go, Lots so <laughs> so you can't always kick the kids out. We're having a meeting. Come <laughs> 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 you're having a meeting. Here's your snacks. Hello. I'm serious. Don't. Don't. I, I'm very serious. You don't. They, sometimes there's nowhere to go, and and you also have to be. You also have to be honest about your your schedule and your life. 
So if I wait, if, if Jay and I only had sex at night, we would hardly have sex. Because Tierra don't go to bed till 10. So if I wait till she go to bed, I'm asleep by then. So sometimes it's got to be in the morning. That, just last week, what you doing at noon? I ain't doing nothing at noon. You doing something at noon? I meet you at the house at noon. I mean, you have to and have to be able to get out of the house at noon. So it has to be a priority. And I know for me, and I'm just talking about me, I have a limit to how many days my husband is allowed to go. Ooh, okay. That's good. That's good. Because That's I don't want him... Right. Too much time. <laughs> well, no, I'm serious. I don't want him to... Be hungry. Uh, <laughs> because it's too much time. <laughs> <laughs> He's fine. You know, Listen, they're looking and they're lurking, and so it has to be a priority. It has to be a priority, and you have to get creative. Okay, let's talk about being creative just for a minute. <laughs> that was my favorite thing. I like it. I like it. So, yes, if you have small kids, lock the door. Make sure you have good locks on your door because they will walk right on in. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but, yes, anytime, put the kids down. You do what you, put your kids on a schedule. My kids, when it was boom boom night, at 7.58, bedtime is 8 o'clock, 7.59, please sleep well, good night, amen, and go, and you cannot come out for the bathroom, you don't need water, you don't need to go to the bathroom, you better not leave this <laughs> threaten them, threaten them. You know, but here's the thing, sex doesn't always have to be in the bed, okay? Get in the kitchen. Sex doesn't have to be in the house. Get in the back seat. Go to the bar. Okay, just make sure pops ain't there. Okay? But, you know, spice it, because, okay, let's just be real. Wives, okay, maybe this is my testimony. It was good and plenty before marriage, and then when you get married, you ain't got time, but you had all the time before you were married. Don't do them like that. <laughs> don't make your husband you in covenant and now he gotta beg you but he didn't have to beg you when you was a girlfriend mm. Mm. so don't do him like that light bulb yeah red light you mean a red light okay that's my mentee get you a red light I gave you, I gave you, I gave you a red light get you some fruit roll ups that's a lot of okay and if you need any other advice, see us after we are no longer alive. Right. Oh, oh, my mama, oh, mama, oh, mama, oh, mama. Okay, anyway. How do you feel like you got to the ring? But just, just FYI, we're going to do couch marriage edition. Marriage is going to be marriage month, so stay tuned. And we're going to cover all this. Yeah. Ooh, we'll hook them up. Ooh, okay. So another topic about boys. Boys, yes. How do you desire a relationship without idolizing it? Plus, keeping God first. Yeah, yeah you you living your purpose. You're having a you having the time of your life just being single. And I think that once you make it an idol, it becomes an idol and becomes bigger than life. So I think that you really have to find fulfillment in who you are as a woman and really take the time to discover you. Like going to therapy was the best thing ever for me because there was things on the inside of me that were going to affect a future marriage. And I was just like, oh, whatever. That's you know, that's just my childhood. That's just raise the church because that's how I am. But no, take the time to discover it and stop thinking about it. Like my mom told me a couple years ago, stop thinking about it so much. Like stop thinking about it so much. Like what you meditate on becomes the priority. So I think that you have to begin to enjoy life, get around some good people, go to therapy, get a mentor, find a hobby, you know, or theory fitness is like my jam right now. It's, it provides you so much excitement and validation, but you gotta enjoy life. You got one life to live. We was in a pandemic all locked up for two years. Come on now, enjoy your life, get around some good people. I'm telling you, for me personally, I mentor teen girls. I have 200 teen girls that I'm blessed to mentor, and they're my lifeline. They keep me busy, they keep me active, they keep me sharp, they keep me in my purpose. I'm excited to do life with them. And so that keeps me focused, and I just decided, God, you got it. This day and pull out here, say to friends, listen, <laughs> love the one you got. Okay? Just love on them, get your fruit roll up, whatever y'all doing in the marriage bed. Just love the one you got, because God got to do it in this season. Real talk, these men are broken, and they refuse to get the help that they need. So enjoy your life. 
find events like this. Talk to Jamie is the best person to talk to in a season of singleness. She gets it. She gets it, and she's funny, and she's light, but she's going to give it to you real. Get you some good people around you. Go to the festival. Me and Tootie was, Tootie's married. My girlfriend back there married. But I needed a moment. We went to Jazzy Jeff, had a great time, festival, had a time of our lives. Get around that. Do more of what makes you happy in this season, and I, and I promise you, he loves a happy woman. Your husband wants you to already be happy. Want you to already be fulfilled. They enjoy that. So find life. Get around some people. Get off TikTok and social media. Go get a book club. Create one at work. Get in a program. Do you. Live your life. Enjoy life. Enjoy life. I love that. All right. I guess we'll, we'll do rapid fire. Okay. Ooh, I like that. Friendly versus flirting with a guy. Is there a difference? Yes. Yeah. And how do you tell the difference? <laughs> yes. Friendly versus flirting, yes, you're doing too much. You got too much dick on your chip when you just go in the space all the time. All in the space all the time. Just get out, get out of space all the time. Yeah, stop that. You know, it's hey, you know, okay, you didn't told me you didn't told him his tie looked nice three times now. Go on now. You know, you're doing too much. You know, and then he didn't come around that corner too. Go go on, Johnny now. Stop it now. It's okay to compliment a man, it's okay to tell him he looks nice. That's, that's natural, that's who you are, but when it's too much, especially, this whole work-wife thing is real. Like, I was a work-wife, but mine was single, right? But that whole work-wife thing, because you're at work a lot of the time with, with men of the opposite sex or whatever, that thing is real, and there's some real soul times that come involved in that thing. So you have to guard and protect your heart as a single woman. You told Johnny he looked nice, he knows he looks nice. That's enough. He know, you. he know you look nice. And if Johnny, and my rule was, I didn't date nobody at work. That was just Sade's rule, because I don't like that whole fraternizing stuff. But if, if Johnny want to go out on a date, John, just say, hey, you know, when can we go out and have a talk? But that whole, over, even in church, don't been in church too. Don't preach this and stuff in church. You're doing too much now. Pick your sons too. Don't, 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 don't you dishes, all that. I done told you look nice. Go on now. Is rapid fire, but I just gotta say this because if you're married, there is no flirt. That's inappropriate. So, my, my thing is, no man is ever gonna look at my husband and be like, mm, but if you only knew. You know what I mean? Like, look at my husband, like, you don't know what she said to me yesterday. You don't know how she felt. Oh, no. No man will ever get that space. So, never be able to. If you're married, there is no flirt. And as a single woman, you have to, you set yourself cheap when you allow too much flirting. You know, because then you become the girl that's supported around the office and nobody's going to take you serious or work or church, whatever. So you have to put a standard up. You know, when men tell me I look nice, thank you so much, have a great day, go on. You know, when the coffee and all that is on the desk and all that, you throw that stuff away and you say, all right, hey, bro, you know what that? Oh, that was their feeling. Thank you so much, bro. You look nice today. You know, but as a single woman, don't sell yourself cheap. Don't sell, if that's not what you want to pursue, that's not what, that's not, uh, it's not, uh, we agreeing to do that. Then you selling yourself cheap, and he's in the way for your husband. You didn't pray to my husband. That ain't it. If, if that's not what you wanted to be, but there's some value on you. Court me. Ask you to go. Ask you to go to lunch. Put, put some roses on this desk. Right. Send me an email that says meet me for lunch at such and such. All that flirting and stuff. We're going somewhere. I love yeah. that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Next question. What are some signs to endure or transition out of a relationship slash marriage? I think if it's a marriage that's between you and God and whoever you seek, you know, counsel from regarding your marriage, because as uh, Jamie said already, you know, there are so many things you can get through in marriage and your marriage can survive. So I don't. I don't want to say what some signs are to transition out of your marriage. I think that's between you and God and your counsel. But in terms of a relationship, if you're not married yet, honestly, for me, the biggest thing is the relationship with God. And whether or not there is, for a man, whether or not you have somebody that you are accountable to. Mm -hmm. I think for a, if, you're, if you're a man who even, if you are a godly man, but there's no accountability, then who jacks you up in the spirit? You know, if my husband's not acting right, I got a couple men I'm going to call and say, get your boy, because he's not acting right. Mm -hmm. And so if he won't um, yield to a, accountability, I think that's a sign. And also just if you guys don't have the same, because it's not enough to just be saved, but what what is, 
Wow. You know, where are we in this right. in this spiritual walk? Because you can be saved and succumb to pornography. You can be saved and be a cheater. You can be saved and be a thief. Mm -hmm. You can be saved and be a liar. Mm -hmm. So let's also look at character traits and integrity as well as just, oh, he goes to church. Yeah, mm -hmm. I would just, yeah that's good too. I would just add that if you're unmarried and the person is unfaithful, run. Yeah. Trust it. Trust what you feel in relationships. Yeah. Trust yourself. Yeah. Get out. Get out now. Yes. Don't do that to yourself. Yeah. All right. Last point question: Can men and women be friends? And if so, what are the correct boundaries to have with the opposite sex? Well, I think it depends on if the relationship is if the other components are married. Let's say you're friends with okay, Tetra and I are friends. Okay, Jerome and I are not. Okay. But I love Jerome, okay? But my relationship, I'm going to pursue a relationship with his wife. I think it's a red flag if uh, someone of the opposite sex is pursuing a relationship with your spouse, but they're not pursuing one with you. Yeah. And I, you can be Mike and Jamie's friend, but you're not going to be Mike's friend. Right. 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 Okay? And I think those are important boundaries. So in this regard, can a man and woman be friends? Under those circumstances, no. But if it's just casual, like when they, when you young and you like this age and it's a whole group of y'all and everybody just hanging out, y'all grew up together, then perhaps. But when those individuals are married and you're talking about friendship, yeah. because in friendship there's a level of intimacy, yes. then you should be trying to be a friend with their spouse. That's right. Even yeah. even if it's a circumstances where let's say it's someone I grew ooh, ooh, I grew up with, uh -oh. I grew up. Can you hear me? Now? I grew up with, and he's a male. If he's not pursuing a relationship with my husband now that we're married, then we're most likely not going to be friends, which is why I don't have no male friends then. We're like we're my best friend, his wife is in the room. He got married and she became the second part of the best friendship, right? So it was no we don't go to dinner without his wife. And not because she she should have not that she ever trips, but it's a respect thing. You know what I mean? Like Where's Asia? Where's the kid? What we doing? We, are we going out and hanging out at Spring's homecoming? Where's, you know, where's she at? Let's go out. It's a respect thing because it was cool when you were both single. It was cool, but out of respect, and that's, that's just a good friend. Out of respect, I want your wife and the kids to come along. There's nothing that we're talking about that she shouldn't be privy to anyway. You know what I mean? Like, so I think that that is important that, because at my age, at 35, a lot of us are getting married, we're moving, they, life is shifting, so we're having to shift. And some people, can't handle that. Some wives like, nah, y'all too close. Nah, Shade got a piece of your heart I could never have. Nah, Shade, bless you, sis. Thank you for what you was doing. And that's cool. But there are situations that we really honor that friendship. Why not? Why Why is she not a part of the situation? Yeah. Okay. Yes, and I'm sorry, I just want to add a little bit of, for someone who's my age and you're just, you have just good acquaintance guy friends, guy friends, okay? When it comes to texting them, just be careful, especially of the time. My dad, was, maybe it's just because my dad was overprotective, and he still is because I'm his baby girl. But when it comes to texting guys at certain times, you feel certain things, okay? You got it. No, no, I'm, I'm being for real. You got to be careful because friends like to be lovers. Yes, I know. And sometimes those friends will wait just so they can pounce. So they ain't no friends no more. Okay? <laughs> All right? So, and, yes, pounds. Lovers and friends are not Ooh. just a soul. Tell us. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> but okay. Go ahead. Is this the last question? Yes. This is the last okay. question. What keeps you longing more for Chris? Oh, that's a Ooh, great that's question to end on. Oh, my goodness. Oh. Faithfulness. Yummy. He came and got me when I was a 20-year-old hot mess. Um, no, seriously, I was suicidal. I was really questioning life, like, why am I here? Um, I, I, I wasn't even saved. I wasn't a church girl. I didn't, wasn't raised in, in church, but I always knew God was real. That's something I always was very well aware of. And I'll never forget sitting in the car 20 years old and just thinking, God, there's no way you created me for this kind of life. I just knew there was no way. That when he thought of me, this is what he thought of, thought of for me. So I said, I tried it my way for 20 years, and now I'm going to try it your way. And he has been so faithful. And when I'm mad at him, when things don't go my way, when I don't understand, I think, well, God, if I'm feeling this way with you, what would it be like without you? And I don't want to know 
what my life, my marriage, my children, my finances, anything about me would be like without him. So his faithfulness keeps me longing for him. I was a 23-year-old girl on my bedroom floor. Should have had a nervous breakdown. Was dating a guy who I, knew, I just thought I was going to marry and be, be with. And he led me to a nervous breakdown. And I said, God, I watched people in church get delivered, healed, set free, run around, spit, fall out. And here on my bedroom floor, don't know where to go with life. And if you get me off this floor, I will live for you forever. And that, that man got me off the floor, and here I am living for him forever to tell every woman that I encounter about the Jesus that I know. And so that's, I'll forever live for God, because I know he did for me on a bedroom, not at a church, not at the altar, on my bedroom floor, I know what he did for me. Mine is his consistency. I cannot think of a time where God just did not come through for me. And, well, I mean, I can just go back to the beginning of my life. So many times I was not even supposed to be on this earth, but I'm here because of his promises, and he's just so consistent. You said faithful. You know, but just, I mean, he is beyond faithful. I mean, he's just always at, no matter what the circumstances, I trust God so much that I don't care how chaotic the situation is, I know he's going to come through. And I don't have to be, have anxiety about not having what I need or not having the answer or the bottom fallout. Because these were, you know, just thoughts I had growing up as a child because of the dynamics in my home. Um, I was always concerned that it, that something was going to happen, like the carpet would get yanked up from under me, and, and not a one time in my life. I mean, in my marriage, in my, with my children, with my professional career. I mean, God has gone, done exceedingly abundantly above and beyond anything I can ask or think, and he has just been consistent. I don't care what the circumstances. I know he's got that. Amen. I'd say for me, it's his grace. I think for me, someone who has grown up in the church, I've grown up with a lot of legalistic, religious, you have to do this, you have to do this, to, you know, to know, to make sure you're saved and all that stuff. But for me, it's just like, God, I don't care where I go. Like, obviously, I care where I go, but like, you know that no matter where I go, you're going to be with me. Yeah. And there are certain times, there have been certain, certain nights where I've just been like, Lord, I just, I'm just so like, so sad because I just I just don't feel joy. I just don't feel joy because I feel like you're gonna be mad at me or you're gonna be upset at me because people would be like, oh, you know, you can't mess up or you can't do this, you can't do that. And I think just the Lord showing me like, you know what, even if you mess up, I got you. Yeah. I got Amen. you, I'm right here. And you know, it takes a special type of love to be able to love through your worst mistakes. Yeah. Like yeah. even, it doesn't matter what it is. God loves you. And I just think that it, throughout this entire night, we've been able to see just how God has been able to show sprinklings of his love and just like, oh my gosh, I got you. I love you. This and that. Just to be able to show, like even on a day like Valentine's Day where it's full of the world just loving people and people define love in so many different ways in this time and age, but God has been able to show, can I use like consistency and how he loves and I think that that's something that we're able to see through the night is he's been able to show his love through the music, through the prayers, through the answers to these questions, all of that. So. Well, thank you guys so much for coming. I'm not sure if we're still live, but if we are, thank you for coming. We're not. It's all right. Um, but thank you guys so much for coming. We're so, I, I'm just, I'm in awe of just how God has been able to move and to shift through the different um, age generations that are here. It's just showing that, you know, we have one thing in common and that's our love for the Lord. And um, I'm just, I'm super, super grateful for that. I want to pray. But before I pray, I want us to just be real and examine our hearts. Because I know that the Lord does not want us to leave without leaving change. And obviously you can talk to us afterwards if you would choose to. But I just want us to come into this prayer that I'm about to pray with an open heart. An open heart for the Lord to reveal to us, to speak to us, 
and to comfort us in any way that he needs to. Father God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this night, Father God. God, you are just so good, Lord. God, we cannot thank you enough for your faithfulness, Lord. God, you keep showing up for your daughters, Father God. God, we thank you that you love us, Lord. God, we thank you that we don't have to run to things of this world to find love, to find joy, to find peace, to find contentment, but we can run and find it in you, Lord. You can satisfy every desire that we need, every desire with, that a boy would feel, that, that any type of relationship would feel, that a purse would fill, that a pair of shoes would fill. Lord, you are wanting to fill that for us, Father God. Father, we thank you, Lord, for just the lives that have been changed, the lives that have been impacted, Father God, for the better. Father, we thank you that this is going to speak on for generations to come, Father God. God, we thank you that these women in this room, Father God, that their children are going to be able to speak of their faithfulness, Father God. That their children's children are going to be able to speak that my grandmother and my mother were a woman of faith, Father God, because we did not give up, because you did not give up on us. Father, we thank you that tonight marks the genesis of what you are going to be doing, Lord, in this year. The genesis of what you are going to be doing in our lives in this future, Lord, in the generations to come, Father God. This is just the beginning. Father, we thank you for the connections that have been able to be made with other women, Father God. Women who have the answer to their problem. Women who are not comparing themselves to the other girl next to them, but are wanting to encourage them, Father God. Fruitful relationships in the name of Jesus. And I declare and I speak just blessings upon every woman here, Lord God, every person in this room, Father God, under the sound of my voice, that we are going to be leaving changed, Father God, ready to make a mark and impact where you have planted us and where you have placed us. And God, we say that it is well, Father God. It is good because you are good and you are in this situation. In Jesus' name, amen. No rush, but a rush. It's not to be out at 8.30, but you can stay till 8.29 and grab your <laughs>